I'm Dan Stageman. I'm the Director of Research Operations here at the college, and welcome to our third and final OAR book talk of the fall 2018 semester, featuring Associate Professor of Philosophy Michael Brownstein and his book, The Implicit Mind, Cognitive Architecture, the Self, and Ethics. As I said, Michael Brownstein is an Associate Professor here at John Jay in our Philosophy Department whose research focuses on feelings, thoughts, and actions that are hard to explain in terms of intentions, deliberations, and one's conscious sense of self. Brownstein integrates empirical research with philosophical theory, theorizing with particular emphasis on understanding implicit attitudes. He has worked on questions having to do with identity and responsibility for unintended actions, and has investigated the ethics of automaticity focusing both on how agents can regulate their unwanted attitudes and biases, and also whether and how one's inclinations and habits can ever become reliable guides toward ethical action. Dr. Brownstein is co-author of the 2016 two-volume series, Implicit Bias and Philosophy, and was recently awarded the Scholarly Excellence Award, our own Scholarly Excellence Award, I should say, and a CUNY Mid-Career Fellowship. Uh, please welcome Professor Brownstein. Thanks so much. Um, it's an honor to speak with everyone here today, and thank you so much for coming. Um, two things before I begin. One, uh, it's a pretty small screen for a pretty big room. So um, if you can't see like John Jay College at the bottom, I would definitely encourage you to, to come forward. Um, uh, the second thing is I'm just going to see if I can take this out, because I am a wanderer as I speak. Um, and I won't be able to stay in one, uh, in one spot. <clears throat> OK, so um, I'm going to describe uh, just at first the general idea that gave rise to the, the book. Um, I'm going I'm to just start by talking about um, the idea that there are things that we do in our daily lives that we do really well without having to reflect or deliberate or even know how we do them. And so if you just think about. Um, this very simple ability that we all have to distinguish between a genuine smile and a fake smile. Um, uh, researchers uh, call this a Duchenne smile or a Pan Am smile. Um, so uh, there are cues about various muscles that we use when we're smiling spontaneously as compared to when we're told to smile. Um, but the fact is that you don't need to know any of that to be able to distinguish between, um, say, these two pictures and to be able to tell um, which one looks more spontaneous, um, unless you're too far in the back and you can't really see, um, and which one looks um, uh, intended. Um, so that's a small example, but I find it impressive that, that we can all do this without having to know how we do it or even intend to do it. Um, so think of that as a kind of virtue of spontaneity. Um, it's something we do spontaneously, and it does good work for us in our daily lives. It's important to be able to spot um, uh, what someone else is intending or the kinds of experiences they're having when we're talking to them. Um, but compare that to now uh, looking at this picture, say, and immediately being able to tell just on um, uh, first glance uh, that these are all philosophers. Um, but compare that to this, and you might not think philosophers without having to think about it. So now I think, okay, we've got the very same kind of immediate registration of what's going on in the world without having to deliberate and without having to think. But in this case, this is worrying, right? The fact that we see this, the, uh oh, farther away here, there we go. Um, you might just see this immediately without deliberation or reflection as philosopher, and uh, probably a lot of you in this room see this and don't have that immediate sense of philosopher. Um, so think of this as a kind of vice of spontaneity. And this is sort of what gave rise to the puzzle for me, that um, one and the same uh, um, mental mechanism or mental process, um, that is to say, um, immediately perceiving information in the world without having to think about it, 
um, can give rise to some very important skills and capacities we have in life, but um, can also um, uh, cause moral problems in our lives, can um, cause us to soak up stereotypes or prejudices about other people. So I'll give you a few more examples, just, just to sort of put meat on the bones of what I'm talking about and that, that generate the discussion in the book, and then I'll talk a little more specifically about the book. Um, so just think of these kinds of examples. Hopefully you can relate to at least some of them. Um, you encounter a large painting in an art museum and you automatically step back for a better view. Right? So you just immediately upon seeing it, you have this sort of um, feeling that you need to back up in order to see it right. You don't have any sense of the, the number of feet you need to be. Nobody ever told you how far you're supposed to be from paintings of various sizes. But you have the spontaneous sense that to get the right view, you need to back up. A talented musician improvises spontaneously. Um, there's a lot of literature here um, in neuroscience, for instance, about what's going on in the mind of improvisers. Um, but even just from the perspective of artists, athletes as well, who act um, spontaneously but skillfully, um, there's this sense that, that you don't necessarily know what you're doing at the time, but you just have the ability to do it well. You're fully convinced by Ayn Rand's philosophy, but you just can't help donating money to charity. Um, so uh, this is an example I have in mind of somebody who's convinced by ideas that I at least think are not particularly compelling. Um, ideas about uh, selfishness and, and your, the importance of your own needs over others, but you just can't help doing good by other people. Right? So this is a case where your spontaneous, spontaneous actions are kind of getting it right, even though your ideas um, about what you ought to do might, might have it wrong. A participant in an economics experiment acts more generously when under time pressure. So there's lots of literature, literature here in behavioral economics about um, putting people under time pressure or in other, in other ways depleting their cognitive resources. Um, and a lot of the times what you see is people act more pro-socially under those conditions rather than more selfishly. You smile reassuringly to someone who seems uncomfortable in a conversation. Again, this is the kind of thing that some of us are better at than others. I always imagine um, the moment during Barack Obama's inauguration where they flubbed the oath of office. Um, and he sort of paused and he very reassuringly smiled as if to say to Chief Justice Roberts, it's okay, go on. Um, and he did that very spontaneously and he sort of is emblematic to me of somebody with those kind of spontaneous social skills that the rest of us might admire. You dash into a burning building to save a child. New Yorkers might remember um, the case of Wesley Autry, who was called the subway hero. Um, he saw uh, a man who was having an epileptic seizure on the subway tracks. He had fallen onto the tracks, and he sees that the train is coming, and Autry jumps down onto the tracks and holds the guy down as the train goes over and saves both their lives. Um, uh, if you look at... Um, accounts of what people who do these sorts of heroic actions say, they always say something like, I didn't think for a second, I just saw what needed to be done and I did it. So these are a variety of kinds of cases, they're all different, but they all have something in common, I think, about um, acting both ethically and spontaneously. But of course, as any parent knows and has said to their kid, think before you act, Acting spontaneously is not always a recipe for doing the right thing. So your five-year-old punches a kid in the playground, right? Um, we know that one thing we say to our kids in those cases is you've got to think about someone else's feelings, right? Don't act impulsively. There's clearly something right about that. A person suffering from alcohol addiction succumbs to temptation. The predominant way it, um, of thinking about addiction is thinking of it as a um, giving in to temptation, and giving in to a certain impulse that's, that's problematic in our lives, acting too spontaneously again. You profess your love to a friend when drunk. Um, so alcohol or other drugs, um, you know, we all think of as diminishing our inhibitions, causing us to act more spontaneously, but also worse in lots of cases. A psychologist asks you if you're willing to eat a cake that looks like a cat's litter box, and you hesitate. Um, 
So uh, Paul Rosen at the University of Pennsylvania has these ingenious experiments where he's triggering people's disgust reactions um, and showing how irrational our disgust reactions can be in lots of cases. So in this one, people say, yes, I know that's a cake. I see that it was made of flour and sugar and chocolate, and I have no objection to everything that went in it. But ew, I'm not going to eat that. Um, <clears throat> there's something off there, even if you might share that reaction, there, you, you can see that even in yourself there might be something irrational about that reaction. A person who is HIV positive cuts his finger and momentarily feels afraid of infecting himself with HIV. I talk about this example in the book. It's an example that comes from an artist named Barton Benes who um, created an installation at the Smithsonian and other um, places that had objects filled with his own HIV positive blood. And in an interview and in explaining where he came up with that idea, the idea being to show the symbolic power of blood and its relation to the um, uh, um, early days of the reaction to AIDS in particular, um, he talked about this experience of cooking dinner and he was cutting vegetables and he cut his finger and his first reaction was, oh my God, I'm gonna be infected. Um, now, on reflection, he knew, of course, that that was irrational, that he can't infect himself, um, but uh, uh, he had the reaction nevertheless, right? And um, I think there's probably experiences that lots of us have, have, have had um, to that effect. Lastly, despite your intentions, you give slightly better grades to male students than female students. So, of course, this is a kind of implicit bias case, which is um, what a, a lot of my work has been on and, and what I talked the most about in the book. So the phenomenon is where one whereby um, you may have earnest intentions to be fair-minded, say in this case as a, as a professor grading, to not be influenced by gender, um, but um, are convinced that, that it's possible that bias is affecting your decision-making nevertheless. Um, and so what I want to do now is just sort of jump for a second out of talking about the book and just briefly introduce you to the concept of implicit bias and um, how uh, you ought to think about it in order to know what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm going to just briefly, how many people in here have, have heard of like the implicit association test? Okay, so maybe like a third. So for those people, I'm sorry, this will feel a little redundant. But what I'm actually going to ask you all to do right now is just we're going to do an IAT, an implicit association test. It's, a, it's like a demo version, not scientific. Um, but I want to give you a feel for why I think this is a powerful um, uh, kind of research. So I'm gonna, we're going to do four quick trials, and we're not going to do anything that should be uncomfortable. But when I say go, I'm just going to ask you all to like tap on your knees. Um, and, and you're going to either tap on your right knee if a flower word comes up, or your left knee if an insect word comes up. So words are gonna come up in a little circle, and your goal is to get it right, and to get it right as quickly as you can. Okay, so as soon as the word comes up, you wanna tap the appropriate leg. Does that make sense? Okay, so here we go. One, two, three. Okay, can people in the back see? Can you read the words decently enough, so-so? Um, <clears throat> feel free to move up if you want. We're gonna do this three more times, so um, uh, please feel free to move forward. Um, you all are very soft tappers. That made me worry that you can't see. <laughs> okay, so one more time. This time it's gonna be right taps for good words and left taps for bad words. And as I often say, the trick here is not to be philosophical. Um, uh, these should be obviously good words or obviously bad words. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Uh-oh, never mind. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so 
two more times now. That one didn't seem too difficult, I'm guessing. I heard actually, I, all I can do is like listen for people being in rhythm, which is a very bad proxy for if you were to do this on a computer, the computer can register very accurately um, how, how quickly uh, you're responding. So this time it gets a little harder because you have to keep track of two categories for each hand. So this time it's gonna be right taps for good words or flower words and left taps for bad words or insect words. Okay, here we go, one, two, three. Okay, good. So um, I said that was gonna be harder, but it actually still sounded pretty good. Um, so one more time now, this, it's gonna, this time it's gonna be right taps for good words or insect words, and left taps for bad words or flower words, okay? Um, last time we do this, I promise. One, two, three. Okay, not so good. <laughs> um, so some of you uh, soldiered on all the way to the end here, but I can hear it kind of coming apart, the wheels coming off as, as you get like halfway through. So why is that? Why is this last one so much more difficult than the one before? Does anyone want to take a quick guess? That's good, that's a good guess, right? Because the, <clears throat> that's right, good. So um, that's what's called an order effect in, um, in the literature. So you're right that, that um, by giving you the other order first, I sort of conditioned you to that and here. So um, as I said, when, when this sort of test is done online, you can measure real precisely people's response times. The other thing you can do is randomize the order. Um, so I won't make you all suffer for do, from doing this again. So here's, here's the influence order effects have on the outcome here. Um, it does play a role, um, but not that big of a role. And I can assure you that on average, if millions of people take this test online, which they have, um, despite the order, no matter what order you get the test in, people find this one harder than the one before. They go slower and they make more mistakes. Um, the reason is, anyone wanna, one more guess maybe? Go ahead. That's right. Right, so most of us like flowers more than we like insects. Um, or to put that slightly more technically, um, we find it easier to associate flowers with good words than insects with good words, or vice versa, we find it easier to associate insects with bad words um, than flowers with bad words. Um, unless this was a room of entomologists, that's a pretty common finding. Um, so now, just take that um, uh, fact, and, and even more importantly, just the feeling you had in your fingers as you were fumbling and trying to do this last trial here, and, and think about replacing the categories with concepts about gender and math and reading words. So this is exactly the same as what you just did, um, graphically speaking. I mean, this is a, like a graphical representation of what it would look like. But here the categories are boy names and girl names and math words and reading words. And this item list is just the items that went around in the circle. And there's two key kinds of trials. So the stereotype congruent trial is the one where the categories are consistent with common social stereotypes. So the hypothesis is that people will find the stereotype congruent trial easier than the stereotype incongruent trial where the pairing of categories is inconsistent with common social stereotypes. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So um, you might think, so what, right? This is what an IAT really looks like. You can take it for free online at projectimplicit.com and it's uh, anonymous. Um, so you would sort word, the items here into the categories. You might think, so what? This is just like a computer game. Um, the so what is that it appears that this sort of test um, predicts outcomes in the world that you might care a lot about. 
Um, so one study that looked across nations at over half a million people found that um, over 70% of those people found it easier to associate science words with boy names. Perhaps that doesn't surprise you. Um, but even more strikingly, that measure predicted national gender differences in levels of science achievement amongst eighth graders. And it did so while an explicit measure, that is to say just a questionnaire of what people think about the relationship between gender and uh, science ability, did not. There was no relationship. So just to make that clear, in countries where the, the majority of people have a science male association, where they find it easier to pair science with male, you see these gender differences in ability amongst eighth graders. Now that's not, that's not causal necessarily, but, but that correlation between um, IAT data, implicit association test data, and real world outcomes has been repeated across many, many different domains and for many different kinds of uh, outcomes. Um, so, <clears throat> I'm a little far away from the computer, so it's, okay. So there's a lot of different kinds of IATs. Um, so here's just three examples. There are body image IATs. Um, there are uh, gender career IATs. The most commonly known one is the race IAT, which uses uh, images of black and white faces and uh, good and bad words. Um, there's a, it's, it's been a hugely pl proliferating area of, of research over the last 25 years. Um, so, jumping back into the book now, I wanted to think about how it is that our spontaneous reactions or our spontaneous inclinations can um, become so biased, can become so morally and ethically worrying without forgetting about all the virtues of spontaneity. And my hypothesis was that um, these cases are products of one and the same type of mental processing. Um, and that's what I theorize as implicit attitudes, that both, both the virtue and the vice cases of spontaneity are products of our implicit attitudes. And so I try to answer three questions in the book. There are three sections. Um, the first one, uh-oh, there we go. Um, the first one is what features do the virtues and the vices of spontaneity have in common? What explains that similarity? And this is the section that has to do with um, what I'm calling cognitive architecture, has to do with what I call cognitive architecture. Um, how we should understand the different parts of the mind. Um, and my claim is that, that um, <clears throat> implicit attitudes are a kind that is to say, they have a core set of features that give rise to all these various kinds of cases. The second part of the book asks, how should we relate to our implicit attitudes? Are they ours in a meaningful sense? Do they shed light on our character or our identity? Are we responsible for them? Or rather, should we think of them as things that are reflections of the world that we live in, as something that happens to us, rather than something that expresses something about us as individuals? Um, so this is a, uh, these are questions about the nature of the self. And then the third part asks an ethical question. How can we act um, both spontaneously and ethically? How can we enjoy the virtues of spontaneity um, without succumbing to the vices? How can we improve the um, ethics of our implicit attitudes? Um, <clears throat> that's the section I'm going to focus on here. I'm going to talk mostly about this third question, the ethical one, but I'll just really briefly summarize the, the, my answer to the first two questions. If I can get the slides to move forward. Okay, so on cognitive architecture, if you think back about the museum goer case, the, the case, this is a case, by the way, uh, for the philosophers in the room that um, Bert Dreyfus and Sean Kelly originally talk about. Um, so the person who's standing in front of the really big painting and has that immediate um, sense that they ought to move back. And you compare that to the IAT case. Um, what might be held in common here, cognitively speaking? So I argue that there are four features to this kind of experience that are paradigmatic. One is the um, perception of what I call a, a feature, which is a salient um, cue in the environment and that is perceived with what I call imperatival quality. That is to say, it commands a certain response. It, has, it acts like an imperative. 
just in the way that a ringing phone gives you an immediate sense to answer it. The, phone ha the, the painting has an immediate imperative um, that's in some sense part of the perceptual experience telling you or commanding you to move back. Um, the second part is uh, a, an affective response, what I call tension, a sense that something needs to be done. Um, this is a kind of low-level affect, so not like a full-blown emotion, like you're sad or happy or disgusted or anything like that. More like a gut feeling, um, a, a feeling of tension that should be resolved through some sort of response. <clears throat> that response is behavior, so in the, in the case of the painting, it might be stepping back. In the case of the IAT slide, it might be pressing left or right. Um, that response is goal-directed. And the goal is to eliminate the tension. There's a great, a great quote um, uh, from Gordon Moskowitz, a psychologist, where he says, goals are suicidal. Um, the, I, I'm paraphrasing now. Um, uh, the point of a goal is to eliminate itself. Um, and that's my sense of, of, of what an implicit response here is. It's to, it's to eliminate that sense of action guiding tension such that you've done the thing that the perception of that cue commands you to do. That's what I call the process of alleviation. Um, uh, I couch that in models of what are called feed forward learning, which is basically the idea that as you respond to cues in the environment spontaneously, um, uh, you learn from the experience. So when you do something that's successful, like um, throw the garbage in the garbage can successfully, you learn from that. When you do something that's unsuccessful, the tension doesn't alleviate, you learn from that as well. I'm happy to elaborate more on that in Q&A if you want. Um, the second section of the book, like I said, talks about the self and the way that we could relate to our implicit attitudes. Here, if you think about just like the difference between uh, a wink and a twitch, um, famous Seinfeld episode, if you're a fan, um, the question is, which, what's the difference between an action in, in the full sense that you perhaps intend, that reflects something about your desires or your goals, and a mere twitch, something that just happens to you? And the puzzle is it might be one and the same physical thing. So a wink and a twitch might have the exact same physical instantiation, um, but mean very different things, right? Whether you're trying to wink versus something's just in your eye. Um, these sorts of cases give rise to questions about moral responsibility. Um, so uh, cases of, say, backing up the car and you didn't see someone behind you, you accidentally cause harm. So whether that, act, whether that event was the result of something you did, an action, properly speaking, matters a lot for the way that we evaluate um, uh, whether you ought to be blamed. Uh, and it matters also in really difficult cases where you might think it hard to, under, to, think, to know the right way to assess the person who does the action. Famous example that's been written about in the literature is the case of Huckleberry Finn, um, who has a bad set of beliefs that he's learned from growing up in the era that he did, that um, slaves are property, and that the right thing to do is to respect personal property. So Jim is an escaped slave, and Huck thinks um, his moral duty is to um, inform Jim's owner because Jim is property, but he can't bring himself to do it, so he does what by our lights is the right thing, and he doesn't um, uh, 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 turn Jim in. Um, <clears throat> but he's acting against his best judgment at the time, or what he, what he takes to be his best judgment. Um, and this is an interesting case for thinking about how to evaluate him. Um, on the one hand, it seems like he, he acted um, empathetically and courageously to us. On the other hand, you might think that he acted in a weak-willed kind of way. He succumbed to a kind of weakness of character because he couldn't follow through on his convictions. Um, lots of theories of responsibility try to answer the question of how should we think about cases like this, of when the self is reflected in some action, when we're responsible for things that we do. Some have to do with awareness, self-awareness. Do you know what you're doing? Others have to do with control. Could you have done otherwise? Others have to do with endorsement, right? Do you reflectively stand behind the thing that you do or do you disavow it? 
Others have to do with reasons responsiveness. So is the thing that you did coming from a place in you that can respond to reasons or is it some sort of automatic um, mechanism instead? A more recent set of theories um, go by the name of the deep self theories or real self theories and these say, um, Actions redound on you when they reflect your real self as compared to some incidental feature of your personality. Um, and so I focus on real or deep self theories here to think about the extent to which or the, the context under which spontaneity reflects on the self. Um, and so just really briefly, I argue that our implicit biases and more broadly our implicit attitudes do reflect on who we are. They're not incidental to who we are. We are responsible for them in an in a important sense. For one, because they're neither innate nor are they just culturally learned. They're not merely reflections of our societies. Um, they also stabilize our identities over time. So again, if you think about that person who has really good social skills, um, that's a trait of theirs as a person. Um, <clears throat> they have cross-situational effects, so they're not narrowly targeted um, in one kind of situation or another. And if you embrace, which I argue we should, a, a mosaic conception of the self according to which we are all rife with contradictions and um, we are not unified, it's not like there is just this one thing that I am, what I am can have contradictions, then I think we can embrace a sense of the self according to which I might wholeheartedly endorse um, gender equality and at the same time find it easier to associate men with science words than women. Okay, but what I'm really gonna focus on is the idea of um, the, um, the question of how to live up to our ethical ideals, how to, um, um, make our spontaneous reactions more virtuous and less vicious. <clears throat> and my answer is going to be that we should heed the advice of William James, um, who was right about everything, um, and adopt what I'll call the habit stance. We should treat our implicit attitudes or our spontaneous reactions as if they're habits. Um, <clears throat> Now in saying that, I, I, this is a picture of Charlottesville, um, I want to just flag a concern that um, in asking how can we live up to our ethical ideals, I fully want to acknowledge that there are lots of people in the world who have bad ideals, who have bad moral beliefs. Um, and I'm just going to throw up my hands for the, for the purposes of this talk and say, I don't have an answer for how to deal with that. Um, the, the, the person I'm addressing, which I'm going to guess is most people in this room, um, if we're talking about, say, an implicit bias case, is the person who does not want to be prejudiced, but acknowledges the possibility that they might be acting in prejudiced ways nevertheless. So I'm sort of um, focusing in on the case of the person that I think has laudable ethical ideals, but recognizes the sources of, of moral failing that, that I think we all ought to recognize but I just don't want to make it sound as if I'm not um, recognizing that there are all kinds of bad actors out there. Okay, so why do I call it the habit stance? Um, I'm borrowing this term from Daniel Dennett who talks about stances as ways of predicting behavior and he distinguishes three kinds of stances you might have. So real quickly he talks about what, what he calls the physical stance, which is predicting what something in the world will do by treating it as if its um, behavior is governed by the laws of physics. So this is the stance you should take, say, if you want to think about how long it'll take for a rock to hit the ground if you drop it out of your hand. Um, you shouldn't think about what the rock wants or what its purpose is. Um, so this is like boo, Aristotle's um, uh, metaphysics. Um, you should just think about the laws of nature. <clears throat> Rocks don't want things, right? They don't fall for purposes. Um, However, sometimes we should think about what things' purposes are. Um, and the second stance that Dennett talks about is the design stance. Treating some entity as if its behavior is governed by some function that it has been designed to have. So this is the stance you ought to take if you want to know what a toaster is going to do if you press the button. Um, the toaster has been designed to heat up um, a, a coil and to warm your toast up. Um, this might also be the right stance to take if you want to know why people have ended up with certain innate dispositions. Um, for example, to feel disgust at the sight of cat litter or rotting meat. Um, 
So the point is that the designer could be something like an engineer, or it could be something like natural selection. <clears throat> it's important to note that in both of these cases, the laws of physics are operating. Of course, toasters work according to the laws of physics, and so do people. Um, but the best, most efficient way to give a good explanation in lots of cases is not to think about um, the laws of mechanics, but to rather just think about design, right? What's this thing's function? It's a matter of explanatory goals, as he says. The last stance that Dennett talks about is what he calls the intentional stance. And this is predicting what something will do by treating it as if its behavior is governed by beliefs, desires, hopes, imaginations, fears, all of what people call folk psychology, the stuff that's in our heads, and maybe to some extent or another is in the heads of other animals. Um, so this is good for understanding what people will do. Um, as Jerry Fodor very um, famously said, if you want to know where my physical body will be next Thursday, mechanics are best science of middle-sized objects, after all, and reputed to be pretty good in its field, is no use to you at all. Far the best way to find out, usually in practice, the only way to find out is ask me. Right? So oftentimes the intentional stance is the best way for understanding human behavior. But not always. So if you think about all these virtue cases of spontaneity and, the, and these vice cases of spontaneity, the intentional stance often falls short. These are all cases that I picked out because if you just ask somebody, why do you do this thing that you do, you're not going to get a very good answer. So there's Dan Dennett. Um, I'm taking his idea about stances, but I'm appropriating it, so I don't want you to confuse what I'm saying exactly for what he's saying. I want to repurpose this idea of stances for thinking about what kinds of interventions, what kinds of tactics or strategies we can use to improve our implicit attitudes. I want to ask, how do we conceptualize the attitudes to take towards ourselves in order to improve ourselves? <clears throat> the habit stance, I argue, is a mixture of all three. It involves rote repetition and practice, activities that operate more or less sub-rationally and that, treat, that, that require you to treat yourself like a mere physical thing, but also appreciating what our spontaneous inclinations are designed by evolution to do and how we can design our environments to um, uh, uh, make it most likely that we act well. That's design stance kind of stuff. And then finally, appreciating the role of goal setting and adopting particular motives. So the habit stance is this mixture of the three other stances on my view. I'm gonna uh, talk about some literature that I think speaks to each of these three elements of the habit stance. And now this is the sort of part of the talk where I'm gonna give you, I hope, some specific ideas for improving the ethics of our implicit attitudes. And I'll fo focus first on practice, on the physical stance-ish kind of stuff. Um, so um, effective change, effective self-improvement, I think it's obvious, requires effort and practice over time. And I think surprisingly this is lost sometimes in the literature, particularly in the literature on regulating implicit bias. So there's a whole literature out there on people trying to figure out how to change our implicit biases. Um, and one of the most um, well-known studies um, my friend Calvin Lai has done where he, he actually created a contest and he solicited people to give him their best ideas for a five-minute intervention for shifting implicit biases. So he said, tell me to do whatever you think I should do. I'll give people an IAT. They can do anything you tell me for five minutes and then I'll give them another IAT. And what he found essentially was that all kinds of different things worked. Um, but when he went back um, the next day and had people do another test a day later or a week later, nothing worked. Everything just went back to baseline. Um, and a lot of people have taken, um, so his examples were having to do with like priming multiculturalism, so that is to say getting people to think about um, why multiculturalism is valuable, or getting to think about, getting people to think about leaders from underrepresented groups, um, counter stereotypes as they're called. Um, and a lot of people have taken Calvin's study to be bad news, like, oh, look, nothing we can do creates lasting change. Um, and I think it's just stone obvious that nothing you can do in five minutes 
is going to change the kinds of attitudes that we have developed over the course of a lifetime of living in a society that's stratified by race and gender and um, uh, socioeconomic status and so on. I think a much better model is going to come from something like sports psychology. Um, the famous 10,000 hour rule, right? To learn anything well, you have to spend 10,000 hours at it. It's actually not a very good rule because some things are many fewer than 10,000 hours and some things are, are many more. So don't really think of it as a rule, but rather as just sort of the idea that to learn something well, you need to practice, practice, practice. Um, so Andre Agassi said, my father says that if I hit 2,500 balls every day, I'll hit 17,500 balls each week. And at the end of one year, I'll have hit nearly 1 million balls. He believes in math. Numbers, he says, don't lie. A child who hits a million balls each year will be unbeatable. This is from Agassiz's um, autobiography. Now, I think this is misleading to some extent because I think most kids who hit a million balls will not become as good as Andre Agassi. Um, but nobody could become as good as Andre Agassi without having hit a million tennis balls. The insight that I'm drawing out of this is that um, skill acquisition, whether it's learning a sport or learning um, to live up to our ideals in everyday interaction, is going to require simple rote practice. There's not going to be a way around that. So yay Aristotle, if, if you're a fan of um, Aristotle's ethics. I like his ethics better than his metaphysics. <clears throat> um, and I think of this as a physical-ish stance prediction. Right? The brain is like a dumb muscle to some extent. Um, it needs to be um, exercised, that is to say, practice and, and repetition. So here's some examples for how that might go um, uh, more specifically. If you look at um, uh, some interesting literature in treating addiction, um, there's a use of what's called approach avoid um, training. Um, and this is simply getting people to practice the thought, approach something like soda, avoid something like beer. Um, this, is, this was a study two different times that were done over the course of a year. Um, so prior to a, a, a established form of treatment, um, people worked through, people with alcohol addiction, worked through four sessions of doing this for 15 minutes. So that is to say, literally just pressing a button when they see beer that's labeled avoid, and pressing a button labeled approach when they see a picture of soda. Right? Nothing fancier than that. But adding these four sessions of 15 minutes to a otherwise um, standard procedure for um, uh, addiction um, made people less likely to relapse after a year. So they just did this for one discrete time and then they came back a year later. Um, this is a very minimal addition to therapy with surprisingly durable effects. It's not done in isolation in that sense that the contest study was rather as a part of a comprehensive treatment. And this exact same methodology has been applied in the case of um, intergroup prejudice. Um, Kari Kawakami um, has tried to reduce implicit racial prejudice on the IAT by having people practice approach and avoid tendencies and so she finds that when people do this training, she's done it with button pushing, she's also done it with a joystick, where when you see, um, so this is for white participants in Canada, when you see black faces, you pull the joystick toward yourself, which is um, signaling a sort of approach um, mentality. Um, uh, what she finds is that um, you get these significant effects on, on subsequent IATs. Um, she's also found that the effects, uh, <clears throat> Um, affect people's unreflective social behavior. So that's things like how much eye contact they make, um, their posture, how friendly they seem in intergroup interaction. So there's, there, there's this, right? So here she's looking at how far away people stand from one another and their bodily orientation. And so these bars here are the um, uh, after approach training um, uh, and the, the, these bars here are the inverse. I think of this as a little bit like the online poker of um, prejudice reduction. So the reason I say that is because um, for people who like playing poker, the hardest thing to become really good at it was just playing enough. Um, but when, when the internet came, came along, people could play online all of a sudden. And instead of seeing um, you know, 15 hands an hour, when you play online, you can see 150 hands an hour. 
So the idea is that these, th this approach training is not supposed to be a replacement for actually approaching people who are different from you and interacting with them. It's a mere shell of that, but you can get the, the mere rote repetition, um, like on steroids, um, uh, in a small amount of time. Um, all of this borrows from what's probably the longest standing approach in the prejudice reduction literature, which is known as the contact hypothesis. Um, Gordon Allport was the person who sort of um, articulated it uh, most famously, the idea being that interacting with people unlike yourself causes you to like them more. Um, uh, there's good evidence for the effects of this. A recent study found um, that people who live in more diverse neighborhoods are more likely to express support for pro-social concepts um, and to help people in need. Um, there's literature specifically on intergroup contact for prejudice reduction. Some of the best studies, I think, are on um, roommates, uh, like freshman roommates in colleges. Um, <clears throat> and what it looks like is random assignment, say, to an interracial roommate situation significantly decreases prejudice. So the thought is, again, um, uh, those sorts of little training procedures, like about approach avoid training, um, are uh, kind of like the contact hypothesis in a bottle, like a little artificial practice session for intergroup contact. What about the design stance? What about thinking about the situations we're in and the kinds of dispositions we have and, and, and how we've been designed by evolution to respond to them? Well, our habits are strongly context dependent. Think about the difference between smoking in a bar if you're a smoker and smoking at a playground. Um, people who are trying to not smoke find it much easier to not smoke in a playground or at work or something like that than they do when they're in a bar. Right? Why would that be? Why are our habits so context specific? Um, well, one is you might think that evolving behavioral, be, evolving habits that are context independent would be a kind of evolutionary dead end. Um, so if you evolved a, a habit like always act aggressively in the face of a threat, um, well, when you meet a threat that's more powerful than you, like a predator or a person who's armed, um, that would be bad news for you. Right? In other contexts, evolving the disposition to respond to threats with aggressiveness might be a good strategy. So the point is that there, you, you might think that there's good reasons why habits are context sensitive. And I, so I think this kind of give rise, gives rise to a design stance principle. The question is, for creatures like us, which contexts moderate which responses and why? Um, so go back to that idea of the contact hypothesis. Interacting with people causes you to like them more. Um, that's only true under some very specific contexts. So there's a lot of literature on when the contact hypothesis works and when it does not work. Um, so if people are working towards shared and meaningful goals, it's crucial for the contact hypothesis that people be doing that. If people are not working towards some shared goal or if the goal that they're working toward is trivial, then you don't see the salutary effects of intergroup contact. Similarly, people need to be on relatively equal status in order to get those good effects. They also need to see themselves as being sanctioned by perceived sources of authority. So this is all telling for doing, say, group work in our classes or um, sexual harassment trainings. Um, getting people to go outside of their familiar groups and work together is crucial, but keeping in mind these kinds of context um, moderators, these, these um, uh, specific situations under which you get the effects that you want. Um, so, I want to just talk in the weeds for one second about um, reasons why I think this applies uh, to our impulsive or spontaneous attitudes. And I'm actually going to go for a second into the animal learning literature. Um, there's a concept uh, uh, from classical conditioning in psychology called renewal learning, which is the idea of the recurrence of some behavioral response after you've learned some new response or after you've unlearned the response that you initially had. So if you think about, say, a rat, sorry if you don't like thinking about rats in labs, um, who's been conditioned to think that every time a bell rings, the rat's gonna get a shock. Um, 
<clears throat> there's two kinds of scenarios here where you could imagine what the rat will do. So after the rat has unlearned the response, so, so this is an ex extinction paradigm, the rat has unlearned the response because the bell rings a bunch of times and the rat is not shocked. But notice the different context here. So one is the rat's in like a purple cage and here the rat is in a green cage. Well, the question is what happens if you change the rat's environment yet again to a third context? And this is called the retrieval context. So there's two different patterns here. Think of this one as an A, B, B pattern. Well, in that kind of pattern, what you typically see is change from the initially, the initially learned response. So the, the rat learns to associate the bell with a shock, then they unlearn that in the purple cage, and now they're in the purple cage, a different purple cage, and they have a, stability, uh, uh, a change sorry, from the original response. Does that make sense, everybody? In this bottom context, you have a different pattern. You have an A, B, C pattern, because it's three different contexts. And there, typically, you see stability of the initially, uh, um, you see stability from the initial situation. So when the context changes and then changes again, you get stability uh, uh, compared to the original response. Does that make sense, everybody? I know I didn't say that quite as clearly as I could. So there's all different patterns you could think about. There's um, AAA patterns, there's um, ABA patterns, and there's AAB patterns, right? And each of these cases, you get a different ultimate r response after the learning of a new response. Okay? I know that sounds like, why am I talking about this? Well, you can use this exact same paradigm to think about the learning and unlearning of implicit attitudes. Um, so think about, um, Think about some guy named Bob, you go into a, a lab, the experimenter tells you like 99 bad things about Bob. He steals money out of tip jars, he's um, uh, a jerk on the subway, he's mean to his kids and all this stuff. So you've now got a bad impression of Bob. But then um, you get this other impression of Bob because now the, psych the, the, the person tells you a whole bunch of good things about Bob. He donates money or donates blood to the Red Cross and he um, uh, volunteers on the weekends for needy children and so on and so forth. Now notice, right, I've got different contexts here again. So like you're given Bob's picture against a blue background and then you're given Bob's picture against a yellow background. So the question is, when your attitudes towards Bob are assessed after learning this initially valenced information and then countervalence information, what do you think about Bob? Sorry, that's that movie, right? What about Bob? I didn't mean that. Um, well, here you have an ABA pattern, and people will typically have negative attitudes towards Bob if the context here is the same one in which they learned the original information. But that can be changed by changing the pattern. So again, imagine you learn a, a bunch of bad stuff about Bob in the blue context. Now you learn a bunch of good stuff about Bob in the yellow context. And now you're given the yellow context for assessment. People will have positive attitudes towards Bob. Right? So that's that A, B, B pattern. Well, what does this mean? Well, it might mean that it's not only important to ha about how to teach something like prejudice reduction, but literally where. Right? So imagine that you're learning a bunch of associations about other people, about social groups out here on the jaywalk, um, and then you, you go into a classroom, you learn from your professor um, a whole bunch of information that contradicts those associations that you learned out there on the jaywalk, hanging out with friends, and then you go back out to the jaywalk and um, you hang out with your friends again. Well, this is that ABA pattern again, and there's reason to think that because of the stability between contexts here and here, you're going to get renewal of what you learned out here despite whatever you learned in here. But you can change that pattern again, right? So imagine here, now you've got the ABB pattern. You learn a bunch of associations outside. You go into the classroom. You learn a bunch of different kinds of things. And then in another classroom, how will you behave? Well, this is this ABB pattern, and you may have change from the initial learning occasion. There's even research that suggests that what matters is not something like the conceptual similarity, but perceptual similarity. Like literally the color of the walls. Okay, lastly, I've said that the habit stance is this mixture of um, uh, physical stance stuff, design stance stuff, and um, 
intentional stance stuff. So what is it that we can do or ought to do in terms of planning, in terms of goal setting, in order to be more ethical and more uh, while being spontaneous? Habits depend on goals, as I've said. Success in goal striving depends not just on how strongly we commit to whatever goals we have, but also how we plan to implement our goals. Um, so here's the intentional stance strategy. Consider your goals and commit to them, to achieving them in very specific ways. Not just um, something like, I want to go to the gym, but when and where and under what situations you'll go to the gym. So there's research in health psychology on what are called implementation intentions. These are plans that specify a relevant cue and a response you're gonna have to that cue. And the idea is to form a plan given a goal in that conditional format. If I encounter A, then I will do B. Um, so if it's like you wanna stop smoking, then you might say something, if I'm at the bar, then I will chew gum. There's widespread data on using implementation intentions in health behavior, like for treating phobias, trying to exercise, reminding, remembering to take medicine or do self-examinations for cancer, healthy eating, binge drinking, and all of the effects appear to be over and above the strength of your goals. So that is to say, one thing that matters is just how strongly you want to achieve the goal, but this other thing that matters is what plans do you make for implementing the right behavior to achieve that goal. <clears throat> so what could we adopt as plans for the kinds of contexts that I've talked about? Well, something like instead of just telling yourself, I want to be less biased, you might form a plan like, if I see discrimination, then I will say something. If I'm deciding how to treat a student, then I will think how I'd like my own child or niece or nephew or friend to be treated. If she's talking, then I won't. Right? That's one that um, Louise Anthony, a philosopher, um, suggested to me when I was worried about how specific these need to be. And she said, no, I think these sorts of plans can be really general and applicable across lots of situations. And that was her example, which I thought was great. What else can we do to plan? Well, I think planning lends itself not just to self-regulation, that is to say making um, plans for your own behavior, but also group decision making. Um, I'm gonna really briefly describe to you a study that I think is really striking on gender bias. Um, so these researchers asked a bunch of people to um, uh, say who they would hire for a job of chief of police. And they described two hypothetical candidates. And they described one of the candidates as having a lot of street experience, but little formal education. And they described the other as ha the opposite, having formal education, but not much street experience. And one of the candidates um, was a man and one was a woman. So for half of the participants in the experiment, the man was described as street smart and the woman was described as book smart. And then they asked people, who should we hire for this job? And most of the participants said, street smarts are the most important, so we should promote the man. And the other half of the participants had exactly the opposite. They, they were told the man was the one who was book smart but doesn't have much street experience. And the woman is the person who's street smart, doesn't have much formal education. And then they were given that same question, who should we promote? And well, lo and behold, what did people say? Book smarts are the most important, promote the man. Right? This is, a, I think, a sort of genius experiment because it's really just hard to fail to see the, the, the mechanisms of bias at work here. But I actually want to point you to another feature of the study. They did a follow-up where they asked people which is more important, street smarts or book smarts, ahead of time, before they told anyone about the candidates. And when people had to settle criteria in advance, there was no hiring bias at all. It completely eliminated the bias. And the thought is something like, once people have committed to a set of criteria, they feel an obligation to um, follow those criteria. They feel beholden to what they themselves have committed to. And this is, of course, planning, right? It's thinking ahead. It's developing criteria and sticking to them and explaining our decisions in light of those criteria. Um, moreover, it, you know, it requires revising them, given the outcomes. And, effect, and evaluating their effects. Okay, so big picture here, given certain goals, given the ideals that I think most of us share to be um, uh, ethical people, I think we should choose self-regulation strategies that take advantage of the way that we're designed, the kinds of creatures we are, 
We should make plans to implement those strategies, specific kinds of plans that specify um, under what conditions, what specifically we're going to do. And we should practice, practice, practice. Um, thanks very much. All right, we do have a few minutes for questions, and I'm going to take the rare organizer's prerogative to ask the first one, because I, I have a burning one. I want to just kind of draw this into the realm of criminology, critical criminology in particular. Um, as a critical criminologist, I think about this a lot. Uh, in critical criminology, we think about punishment in terms of harm and in terms of responsibility much more so than intention. That's a, a sort of deliberate opposition to the not just positivist criminology that, that's at the fore at this point in, in history, but also to the idea of mens rea in law, this idea that there has to be some intention in order for there to be a crime. If we take this as a, a sort of uh, commentary on the relationship between responsibility and intention, what implications does this have for something like mens rea in law? So if we're talking about, for instance, you know, the difficulty of, say, um, you know, finding police officers guilty when they uh, kill suspects or kill individuals with whom they're interacting because it's hard to nail down intent. Or even in New York City, there's an issue here with uh, you know, traffic killings or, or ki vehicular homicide. Uh, what, what are the implications there? Yeah, thanks. That's an um, important and big question. <laughs> um, so I'll just say a few things in no particular order. Um, <clears throat> one is that I think um, there are lots of ways that we, as a culture, hold each other responsible for things um, without having to settle the, the question of intent. Right? So if we think of something like disparate impact in the law, um, where there's a um, business that is not intending to discriminate against anyone, but has certain practices that materially affect one group at the expense of another unfairly. Um, we have mechanisms in our society for holding that business responsible um, to, to remediate the, the problem. Um, now, I think you're asking more about sort of um, moral responsibility, right? And the kinds of um, questions that that raises not only for the law, but the attitudes that we have toward one another that the law embodies, right? Um, I think there are cases there too, though, where intent is not the only consideration and maybe not even the, the, the main one. So if you think about a kind of case like I was pointing to in one of the pictures of the person who backs up in their driveway and hits you know, a kid or a dog or something like that. Right? Well, certainly they didn't intend to do that. Or even a really simple case, I forget my friend's birthday. right? I didn't intend to do that in any way. right? So you think, well, but something has gone wrong here. And it's not the same gone wrong where you know um, a rock falls out of the building and happens to hit you. That's a case where just something bad has happened, but nobody is at fault in any way unless the building was built badly or whatever. Um, so one thing you might think is, well, look, the person is responsible for having checked more carefully behind their car when they backed up or something like that. Right? So the responsibility traces back to decisions they made that created the situation in the first place. So that's a sense, uh, that's a case where you have something like, I think, moral responsibility without intent. Um, but I think there's even lots of cases where um, just in our everyday interactions, um, the way that we take one another um, and the, the sense that we have of uh, appropriate characterological assessment has very little to do with intent. So if, you, if I'm on the subway, let's turn it around. If you're on the subway, and I come by and I just sort of like, you know, rush on and I step on your foot and I'm like kind of pushing my way into the spot that I like, right? I'm not intending to hurt anybody. Um, what I'm failing to do is, is be a considerate person. And the appropriate thought you might have in that case is like, what a jerk, right? I'm just like, a, I'm being jerky in that case. It's perfectly reasonable for you to evaluate my character, to think something negative 
about me um, without worrying at all about what I'm intending or not intending or anything like that. And so I would distinguish that sort of question, the question of whether assessing me as a kind of person with a, with a personality or a character flaw, um, I, would, I would distinguish that from the sort of legal and um, judicial questions about what am I held responsible to do? When may I appropriately be punished or something like that? I think the punishment questions are important, obviously, and, and hard, but also different from the questions about just um, character assessment. Uh, and that's what I'm focusing on when I say something like our spontaneous inclinations are, are up for grabs in terms of uh, responsibility. Other questions? I'm operating on three hours of sleep, so my apologies if it comes out incoherent. Um, no what about controlling this? Uh, so we can say that we can reprogram the individual, but those of high mind that program court um, sort of veiling the demographics of the defendant so that we make the decision that tail end slides that you had that have no, that are, have no influence on the characteristics. Mm -hmm. Have you thought along those lines in court uh, decisions made by justice bodies? Yeah, um, I have uh, to some extent. Uh, so I'm not an expert in, in um, criminology or anything like that. Um, but I've thought about two questions, I would say. So one is, um, some people in, in the law have asked, um, should we be using the sort of implicit bias literature in particular um, in specific ways in legal proceedings? Like think about voir dire or something like that. Um, so typically, the assessment methods that are used in voir dire, you, you may know about this, are terrible, right? Judges can do whatever they want. Um, in some cases, they might just ask potential jurists, are you racist, right? That's a terrible method of assessing people's racial attitudes. So that's raised the question, well, would it be better to say, give everybody an IAT and see what their scores are? And I think we should resist that temptation, and it's basically for psychometric reasons that these tests are not powerful enough as individual difference me measures to say, like, okay, you've taken it once, and now we know you're this percent biased. I don't think we should think about them like that at all. I think their power is just in suggesting to us that we may have biases that, that we struggle to control or that we don't acknowledge. But that doesn't mean I don't think that we can utilize this sort of research in legal contexts. Um, so the lessons might be, one, just the kind of humility that I just talked about, right? The recognition that um, uh, we can be affected by stereotypes in our culture, even if we don't intend to be. So that's like a lesson for, um, say, lawyers or judges. Um, but I think there's probably, I, I, there are lots of people doing research on this that I'm, I'm not that involved with, but ways of, say, settling criteria for witness testimony or something um, ahead of time. So the kinds of example that I gave at the end about the hiring decision. Um, uh, so over and above simple self-regulation, what are the specific tactics our institutions can do to try to um, create the environments in which the desired behaviors are going to be more likely. That's sort of where I would put my mind. And it would be on something like settling criteria. It would be on encouraging leaders to talk about debiasing and talk about fairness, because I think leaders legitimize certain ideas within their institutions. Um, uh, even little things like encouraging, you know, um, casual talk at, at lunch um, uh, about these issues when coworkers are together, um, again, can sort of make it seem okay to people to address these issues rather than make it too sacred to, to deal with or too scary. So I know that's a bit of a vague answer, but this is the best I can do. I think we have time for about one more. Thanks, a very interesting discussion. Uh, I, I'm more interested in, or I'm interested in getting a better handle on what the habitual stance is. Because mm -hmm. I think of habits as being a very broad category. So, you know, uh, I used to crack my knuckles mm -hmm. as a kid and my mother said, oh, it's a terrible habit, yeah. it's a terrible habit. But there doesn't seem to be any semantic content to that, no attitudinal force to that. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're Freud, then maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but, so, 
but you seem to be saying when you habitual stance is that it does have some sort of like semantic content. Or when you say like attitudinal, you mean something like a something we might express as a proposition. Women aren't good at math, or men are men are the ones who become scientists, or something like that. So I, I, I'm does. Also, I guess another way of putting this question is, does spontaneous mean non-conscious? Or is it, was, it just mean something like, if I do this, then I do that? Mm -hmm. Which habitual seems to, more, to be more mechanical. Right, um, thanks. So, um, I don't think of habits in that mechanical way. Um, uh, I think that most of our habits, I'm fully happy to grant that there are examples of habits that are very thin and habits that are very thick in terms of their contents and their proliferating effects in terms of not just behavior, but what you'll say about yourself and, and your feelings and your propositional beliefs and so on. Um, so I, I don't have any specific um, attachment to saying that habit is like a precise notion that captures all these cases. Um, uh, the, the thing I do have an attachment to saying is that um, what I mean by spontaneous inclinations have that FTBA structure that I identified in the beginning, that they involve a, a, a particular kind of perception, a particular set of feelings, um, a kind of action, and a process for learning from that. And I think of those components as very tightly grouped in spontaneity, that it's hard to prize them apart, that we get associations between the, the cue, the feeling, the behavior, and the action. So, you know, you see the exit sign, um, and that compels a certain sort of response, even if you don't follow it, um, and that, that desire or tension for that response is alleviated when, when, you, f when you act in, the, in that way. Um, habit is just a notion that I think captures the three elements of what I think need to be in place for any successful regulation of our um, implicit attitudes. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm fine with there being a whole different range of habits, but I think like if, if you hone in on the, the most salient parts of the habit change literature, you get these three parts that I'm talking about, the, the rote practice, the thinking about context, and the importance of planning. Um, and so that's all I mean when I'm appealing to the notion of, of habit. I, I, I definitely don't mean that uh, implicit attitudes are always unconscious or that they're automatic. Um, those, I think, are vestiges of, of old ways of thinking about um, know-how or bias, and I'm trying to sort of leave that stuff aside. Um, so I hope, I'm not sure if that satisfies you, but that's the way I think about it. And unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you, Professor Brownstein. And again, this is our last talk for the semester, but please join us for three more great talks in the spring. We'll get those out to you before too long.